Hello everyone. Let's take the bull by the horns. No one is reading Lesha Karkovsky's books anymore. Retelling of his most prominent works is not underlying any new ideological disputes. His work no longer stirs up at Horner's nest. It was, it was pushed on to the back burner. At least that's what I thought a couple of years ago, looking at the Polish intellectual landscape. And as much as things might not have improved over here in Poland, um, it is reassuring to know that Kowakowski's work, works are being published uh, and translated in, uh, in Russia. That's why I would like to thank you all very much for organizing this conference. And I would also like to apologize that I cannot be in St. Petersburg in person to discuss the work of Kowakowski with you. I'm certain it will be an inspiring event. Kowakowski was uh, being talked about among the generation of his students or people being under a direct influence of him. It was usually done in the form of storytelling of the past times or an apology. However, in today's 30-year-old uh, generation, the references to Kowakowski's work are strikingly rare, not to say non-existent. Maybe I was not fortunate enough but during my philosophical studies at Warsaw University, none of Kowakowski's books was on my obligatory reading list or was a recommendation for a reading. Yet it was suggested that we read Charles Marx, Karl Marx in huge amounts, says one of the former um, students in the uh, weekly periodical The Liberal Culture, Cultura Liberana. A young sociology professor assistant states similarly that she was never made to read any of Kowakowski's work, never heard him being mentioned by any of her teachers in the manner that Habermas, Mills, Rorty, Feierabend, Darendorf or Baumann uh, were mentioned. Never have any students approached me with a view to writing about Kowakowski or at least referring to his work in, uh, in their papers, and I have to admit, I have never included him in a syllabus to my classes either, says the quoted sociologist. Um, if it happens that this philosophy is mentioned in the uh, public debate or in a coffee shop dispute, it is usually in the form of a publicist uh, rhetoric taken out of context and uh, deprived of the inherent philosophical element, the uh, nuance of, uh, of Kowakowski's thought. When appropriate, young leftists highlight their stance with the authority of the author of uh, the praise of inconsequence, quoting his earlier political or anti-clerical works. Whereas right-wing does the same as an ideological laziness reflex uh, underpinning his later phase, significantly deviating toward conservatism. Regardless, the use of Kowakowski's work uh, and of his philosophical uh, heritage is purely publicist in the uh, derogatory sense of the word. Um, so I wonder why has this happened? Why do Zizek Derrida and Badiou among the leftist, Berlin, Rorty and Rawls among liberals, uh, Karl Schmidt, uh, Leo Strauss and Eric Voglin among the conservatives arouse more interest in today's world. Following a few intellectual generations for whom Kowakowski was the North Star and um, then an unchanging point of reference, there came a time for those who do not feel an urge to refer back to him. It all happened due to his work being deemed anachronistic, far-reaching changes of 1989 
entailed his disappearance into thin air, despite its being undoubtedly a shocking riddle, such an explanation is worth considering. After all, this assumption is based on a common way of thinking. Is it not that the past significantly impacts how, um, how we live our lives nowadays? Totalitarianism, tension between secular ideology and religion, religious traditions, are these not obsolete terms, world problems that do not fraught humankind anymore? We do not have to choose between liberal democratic freedom and communist country prisons anymore. The reality is far more complex. The friction between sacrum and profanum is completely different than what it used to be in the past century. Therefore, should Leszek Korkowski's thought be considered fit for the times it was created in? Would it be only the expression of 20th century spirit of the um, East Central Europe? The fate of his work resembles uh, that of the other prominent 20th century critics, such as George Orwell, Arthur Kestler, or Karl Popper. Their books were like Bibles for intellectuals living in the Cold War. Today, they rarely excite um, anybody and are, a, the, and are usually um, significant only for the, uh, those who like the, the uh, antiquarian bookshops. The significance of Korkowski's books would therefore be limited only to influencing the Polish intelligentsia, in particular leftist thinkers, and their shift from Marxism uh, and a twist of the laic left wing in the direction of Christianity. This very shift constitutes, constituted the social and intellectual grounds for solidarity. In other works, in other words, both the uh, main currents of Marxism, as well as the presence of myth, would be fundamental for the creation of a certain train of thought and political movement, which, after 1989, was no longer valid. On the one hand, Polish leftists leaving the church are, um, um, and moving back to anti-clerical stance would be a confirmation of such an interpretation. On the other hand, it would be a breakup of the uh, Liberty Union, Unia Wolności, a party not only formed by many friends of, this, of uh, Kowakowski, but also a party which uh, one can say embodied his idea of conservative um, liberal socialism. This blend of terms suggests that we deal with philosophy of novelties deprived of clear-cut roots. Kowakowski does not offer a firm viewpoint that could be easily translated into a political program. Maciek Dula from Krytyka Polityczna accused Kowakowski of such a tendency in his later works, which I believe says more about Gdula and his expectations uh, towards philosophy than about Kowakowski himself. Looking from this angle, the downside of Kowakowski's philosophy would be the lack of stimuli for uh, revolutionary action. During um, one of the coffee shop disputes among philosophers uh, I was taking part in, one of the representatives of the young uh, generation of Polish thinkers presented to me a thesis that Kowakowski hadn't created even one genuinely new term of his own. My interlocutor has stated that the thesis formulated by the author of the, current, the main currents of Marxism were never were not um, new, but on the contrary, they were present in European culture, at least since the beginning of the 19th century. Putting it differently, Kowakowski hadn't contributed to the development uh, um, of philosophy in any way, and his, uh, his thought sounds like uh, old worn out tile used only for replaying lore-forgotten smash hits. Such a statement assumes 
a particular way of leading philosoph philosophical thought. Um, it implies progress. Accordingly, uh, the new generations of philosophers are to contribute new unknown concepts to the sets of intellectual instruments. Perhaps philosophy should revolve around a limited and relatively narrow number of questions that define the human condition. The questions are always posed slightly differently depending on historical context and the focal point. Henceforth, the thought that prevails as long as it unceasingly challenge and constitute an internal, eternal dialogue. This is the standpoint that is close to, to me and I think it was also close to Kowakowski, um, who I think in the long term rejected the idea of progress in thought. So, the reason for Kowakowski's absence uh, is found is to be found somewhere else than uh, uh, in the explanations I've uh, provided uh, before. The thing is not that Kowakowski's train of thought is out of date, but that it is dispersed, if I may say. In other words, the interpretation that would indicate the holistic view and its coherence is missing. Uh, it would shed some light and present it in, um, uh, in favorable, favorable light on his proposal. Such a status quo is nothing like a coincidence. Because it goes without saying that the broad interests of Kowakowski were um, uh, astonishingly impressive. Uh, in one of his letters, he, uh, he stated himself that, uh, uh, I quote, I have no philosophy of my own. However, certainly, I am interested in philosophy and I write about it from time to time, be it different annotations to some historical disputes or independently, but I have never aspired to have my own philosophy, philosophy um, independent or different from all other philosophies. I suppose that everything is vital in this field uh, everything that is vital in this field had been already said and we should not be mourning about our inevitable fate of the epigons. What is more, I believe that what we tend to claim is a repetition of what has already been said just in the language of our times. Therefore, I have no philosophy of my own and I do not feel the need to have one. Uh, end of quote. Uh, Kowakowski also highlighted the, that, that uh, in, in contrast to the great philosophers, he was never obsessed with one topic only. This persistence getting back to the thought that could have been considered their own or the most basic was always viewed from a different angle, yet unchanged and unique in principle. Kowakowski would be perceived from such a perspective as the author of numerous remarks, yet not a philosopher tres trespassing the outlook of, of his own generation, and capable of describing the world out of the context of the 20th century experience. But maybe Kowakowski's wor work should be read against its author in order to extract its hidden essence. What a core would that be? I think it is not the presence of the myth, it is not the praise of inconsequence, it is not even the irrational rationalism, just to name a few of his most recognized essays and philosophical ideas. The core, the substance of Kowakowski's thought is hardly reachable and barely feeded into clear-cut categories. Moreover, it makes Kowakowski's message simultaneously strong and weak. Strong because it is sharply outlined, outlined uh, um, an original root. Weak as this very root implies looking at everything that is strong 
with a pinch of suspicion. And here's where, as I believe, we get to the crux of the issue, um, and one which is very closely connected with the title of your conference. Namely, Kowakowski's work, works are inherently filled with the awareness of the existence of evil. The fact that this is not that evil is not a coincidence, but rather that it is a an inseparable element of human fate. It can be noticed in uh, this can be noticed in all dimensions of Kowakowski's work. So let's take a quick overview. When Kowakowski talks about politics, he draws the attention to the mutually exclusive ideals that we want to fulfill by means of political action, despite the fragility of each and every institution uh, created by uh, humans. Never are they built on solid fundamentals. Quite the opposite, they are fraught with fragility, impotence and irremovable instability. This evil invades the world of politics from a different side too, from the side of actions. When we are consistently in pursuit of good, it inevitably breaks into pieces, so that again, our own will, uh, as, a, as a result of our own will, against our own will, we are the creators of evil. Um, it can be also said that um, um, the, the same thing can be also said about the influence of the Marxist philosophy. The ideology disapproving of the communist power aimed at enabling people to become masters of their own lives, unifying them with themselves, restore the rule of a universal rationality. That was the promise. Instead, it contributed to a totalitarian state that made individuals even more helpless, alienated, and exposed to irrational external powers. Following Marx's train of thought from the dawn of Plotinus uh, to, uh, to late 20th century successors, Kowakowski reveals not only the complexity of various inspirations under, under its influence, but also uh, destro destroyed the legacy of Marxism from, um, from within, the Prometheanism, romantic elements and enlightenment elements of it. He also depicts that evil nests where human brain claims its right to omniscience, omniscience and willingness to solve every problem that haunts humankind. Marxism was supposed to, exp to, um, to um, describe the entire reality. Instead, it created ubiquitous life, lie. So, omniscience is impossible. Our knowledge cannot be flawlessly transparent. The light of reason is always accompanied by the shadows lurking from behind, unspoken assumptions of our reasoning, hidden in our choices, which we make even before we start analyzing the situation. The myth is inseparable from our world. It cannot be erased or crossed out. It is... Uh, Ubiquitous, it can fit into any crack. The myth, meaning what? The myth being everything that cannot be subject to knowledge, everything that is neither true or not true, um, uh, but something uh, thanks to which things become real, sensible, and viable, true or false. This is precisely what is uh, the thought or the lesson of Kowakowski the epistemologist. Since the access to the entirety uh, of the reality is denied, we are inevitably revolving around certain and uncertain truths. We are stepping on quicksands. It does not mean that what is absolutely precious does not exist. It is merely directly inaccessible. The world in which we are to live and for which we are res responsible is divided and torn into pieces. 
by no means are we to find a map ready to use, a road that gets us to the final destination unscattered, or a simple list of do's and don'ts. We have to make choices, and every choice entails at least some kind of a loss. Tragic loss that cannot be predicted, resulting from uh, diversity, lacking common denominator for reality. Therefore, this is what Kowakowski the Ethic claims, law fails and we are doomed to inconsequence and to varying between mutually exclusive goods. We always need to be mindful of that, that no code, no moral code can take the moral decisions for us. Um, and certainly such an outlook of the world is not uh, popular. We wish for a bright world, one without divisions that cannot be bridged, without conflicts that cannot be avoided, without a metaphysical horror um, that is only echoed by the silence of the universe. Therefore, we revert to entertainment, to, ideolo to ideologies uh, that give us comfort, or to painkillers. We are running away, th though we will never eventually escape. As long as we humans exist, we will never accept a oneself or heal from the illness of pointlessness. Kowakowski, the, the philosopher of culture and the critic of the present day, writes about it quite a lot. It is not the escape from freedom, but rather the escape from evil, that is, the milestone of our times, the deepest desire of the citizen of the contemporary Western civilization. There is no denying that we rejected the utopia um, of a new man and that we no longer believe as a collective in Christian God with the same passion our ancestors did only a few centuries ago. We dream that if we refuse the evil uh, the entrance to reality, our prosperity will not be endangered, our lives will be free from the burden of the moral fault. External background, concurrence of circumstances prevail, though there is no evil that would be an inseparable part of our existence or leave an indelible mark on our condition. That's at least what we try to believe. The death of the devil, and not the death of God, is therefore the fundamental um, sphere or fact of our times. God is still imaginable, but mostly as a sort of a technical monster that due to wielding indescribable computational power supports the universe with its planets and galaxy, but still is there. The devil, on the other hand, moved outside the picture. It is no longer acceptable, not only among well-educated people, but in the world of people with a sound mind, to seriously believe in the existence of devil. So what are we left with? Well, I think what Kowakowski teaches us is that evil will eventually crumble everything that is most important to us. It will turn every project that uh, aspires to uh, giving us uh, unconditional freedom into a new tool of slavery. Uh, it will never let us put the pieces together into a new coherent picture of our reality. Evil is here, always one or two steps ahead and we are always behind it. Behind, behind it, because only by doing evil do we discover the reality of the good that was infringed upon. Only this broken piece reveals the real value. And this is where Kowakowski's message, to me at least, seems to be incredibly strong. Because if we believe in the presence of evil and its reality, it means we also believe in the presence of good and its reality as well. 
uh, as noted by Kowakowski in his very private letter to uh, Józef Chopski, another prominent Polish intellectual, there is a shiny thread which in the eternal darkness that we live in and contribute to ties us faintly with what is outside of darkness, with a bond that can never be broken. Little do these truths warm the heart, but they are still applicable or at least worth considering or debate. They can teach intellectual involvement better than the philosophical works that today's leftist or the anti-modern counter-revolutionary right-wing are so enthusiastic about. Thank you very much.